Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today, I have Avi Mayer of Travel Perk coming to us from Barcelona. How's it going? I'm great. How are you doing? Pretty good. Um, I would just mentioned they're having thunderstorms in Barcelona, yeah. so hopefully we'll get some good, exciting... This is yeah. not what they promised when I, when I moved here, you know? They promised <laughs> sun and beach, you know, and now we have a thunderstorm. <laughs> Where are you from originally? I'm from Israel, from Tel Aviv. I would have guessed that. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. And did you move there? Uh, what, what led you to Barcelona? Um, so I actually moved here for business school and, and kind of decided to stick around. It's, it's an amazing city and kind of has a really nice balance of, um, you know, uh, professional uh, opportunities, but also great quality of life. So, you know, we, my wife and I just decided to, to stay here. And actually, our, our two uh, kids were born here. So I guess we are really kind of a part of the, of the community now. That's great. That's, that's yeah. cool. I've been there years ago, not since I was in college, which feels like forever ago. But yeah, it was a fun, fun town for sure. It changed a lot. I hear. I mean, I, I know I haven't been here before, but before we moved here nine years ago, but apparently it was a completely different city, and it, uh, they reinvented the city, uh, you know, in a way. So super interesting. It's a startup by itself, right? I mean, that that's interesting. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. Well, I do want to talk about kind of the, the, the Barcelona startup scene and funding scene, but let's actually just start off with what uh, Travel Perk does. What do you guys do? We fix business travel. So business travel is, uh, is a $1.5 trillion industry globally, uh, and it's really not working the way it should. So, you know, the two categories that companies have when it, they have to choose a way to uh, send their employees around the world for business these two categories do not work. So the first category we're talking about um, using a travel agent, you know, like you know, the American Express of the world. And I, I always, when I speak on stage, I always ask people, when was the last time anybody here used a travel agent for vacation, right? And unless you go on a very kind of niche, uh, like, I don't know, like a safari trip somewhere, yeah. uh, people don't need, don't need a physical travel agent anymore. They can, it's, it sounds obvious, right? But you book online. So why is it that, that we as companies ask our travelers to use travel agents? That's, you know, it's clunky, it's expensive, they, they charge high fees because they are service-based companies rather than product or technology-based companies. Uh, they, are, they have limited inventory, so it just doesn't work, right? And, and then that's category number one. And, then, and then the second category is giving up and saying, just go and book anywhere you want, right? This is called unmanaged, and that's 60% of this mm. 1.5 trillion I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and unmanaged is by definition you get access to good inventory because you have the entire internet at your at your hands but then you waste time comparing 12 websites on average and you lose oversight as a CFO of the company on knowing what people spend and, and why and what were the other options right so you really have to choose between two bad categories and we looked at it and, and um, I'm happy to kind of expand on, on, on our background as a founding team but we come from booking.com before so from the consumer side of travel gotcha. and and we, we thought to ourselves, why can't business travel behave like consumer travel, like leisure travel? And that's what we're trying to do, fix it in, in a consumer way. Interesting. And is it a, um, a markup on the cost of the travel or is it a more of a subscription model or what's the business model? Yeah, so, so we actually have the same business model as, as leisure uh, travel websites, meaning that we are uh, getting a commission from the supplier, mainly from accommodation, right? Hotels pay... Um, a commission and, and we're getting a piece of that. Uh, it's not a markup, it's just a part of what you pay. Let's say you pay a hundred bucks a night to the hotel, I'm getting some, some of that uh, as revenue. That's the main revenue stream. We also have premium and enterprise accounts where we have guaranteed SLA and, and uh, better payment, easier payment terms. So basically companies pay at the end of the month against an invoice, get credit from us, and then, and then we charge for that on a per trip basis. Gotcha, okay, cool. And is it just in Europe now? You guys are based in Spain, or are you are you global? Um, yeah, we, we are we are global minded. And we have we have um, customers in practically every, every continent of the world. Um, we are focused on Europe at the moment, and, and uh, kind of opening offices now in London and, and Berlin to expand within Europe. Uh, but you know, by by the nature of of, of the beast, really, 
this is travel, right? And even European companies travel a lot outside of Europe. So you have to be everywhere. You have to have a solution that works globally. Yeah, cool. Um, so I wanted to get to the backstory or the, the Genesis story. You kind of touched on that already. You guys were a couple of founders from booking.com and that yeah. was a, was that one of the uh, kind of like the orbits or the, was that in the same category of do it yourself, you know, price comparison yeah. or was it something different? Yeah, no. So we actually, so, so we, I had a startup before uh, called Hotel Ninjas, uh, which we, we did software for hotel management and we sold that to booking.com. Uh, booking is, uh, booking.com is, is um, really kind of today the largest online travel agency uh, for accommodation, right? So they're selling millions and millions of transactions every day. Uh, and they are part of the booking holding group, which used to be called the Priceline group. So it's the same, okay. same, same group as Priceline, Kayak, Open Table, um, Rentalcars.com. So a few other companies within online travel on the consumer side. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. So with Hotel Ninjas, did you, uh, did you raise money for that or did you bootstrap that to your exit? Yeah, we, we bootstrapped and uh, it was a very small business at the time of, of the acquisition. Interesting, cool. Okay, great. Um, so let's talk about raising money. It looks like you guys have raised quite a few rounds. Maybe give me just a summary of how many rounds and, and uh, how much you guys have raised. Oh, geez. Like, I don't know. Many rounds. <laughs> it feels a lot. Uh, it feels like a lot. Yeah, we, we raised a seed round, an A, B, and C. Right. So these are four rounds. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and when did you guys start? So how long has this been in, in business? We started 2015. We, we, uh, we pivoted uh, in 2015. So we raised a seed, $1.5 million uh, seed uh, early 2015. We invested our own money there. So with 300K of our own money and the rest came from angel investors. Um, and then we pivoted and after the pivot we raised uh, the, the, the following rounds. Let's, let's just go a little deeper in, into each one. So the angel round, was that... Spanish angels were these Israeli angels were these just people you knew around the globe what was the make yeah so so actually we didn't have any Spanish investor uh, uh, and that's a little bit a great investor in Spain uh, but we really had global ambitions day one and we didn't want to be number one in Spain uh, we, we keep saying that we are a global company that happens to be in Barcelona because why not uh, but we don't see ourselves we don't have any focus in Spain, not in, not in customers, not in employees. We are, you know, English is, is the official language in the office here and 80% and of, the, of the workforce is, is from outside of Spain. So it just made more sense to raise from, uh, from investors that have this kind of more kind of global um, state of mind. So, okay, so you had in global ambitions from the beginning. Um, so how did you put together this angel round? Where the yeah, um, it was a um, pretty usual friends and family. Uh, I, I hope we didn't have the third F, uh, you know, the fools. Mm -hmm. uh, we are very smart investors. So friends and family. Um, these are you know, mainly business connections. Um, and, and, and so, and then we did have one uh, early stage VC also uh, in the angel round. So we had um, a fund called Local Globe out of London. Uh, and it's run by... Um, uh, well, it was founded by, by Sol and Robin Klein, uh, who were partners at Index. One of the they were the first partners at Index in London, uh, and they, they left Index to create uh, this, this new fund called Localob, and we were very fortunate to have them early on. We actually, I think, the first investment they did out of the fund. Uh, okay. So, yeah, so they, they took most of the rounds, uh, you know, the angel round, and then the rest was uh, mostly, you know, small tickets from, from friends and family. And did you have a product in the market at that point or was this pre-product? No. It was pre-product, yeah. We had a presentation. Uh-huh. Yeah. Not a good one even. <laughs> um, then let's go to the Series A. It looks like uh, that was about an 8 million Series A. And I see some of these names. Some of these names I recognize. Spark Capital, Felix. Yeah. Who, who led your Series A and any stories about putting that together? Yeah, it's actually an interesting one. So, so Spark led the A. Felix actually joined in the B. So, so the A was Spark and Sunstone. Sunstone is a, is a VC uh, here in Europe based in uh, Berlin and Copenhagen. So the story of the A is actually interesting. And I think it, it's probably one of, uh, hopefully one of the first learning points that your listeners can have um, from, our, from our story. Um, in that, we that actually we, we didn't raise, we, we, we didn't, do a proper round, right? We didn't go and do a roadshow and, and we didn't pitch it. Uh, the way it worked is we, we have 
a very close advisor uh, to the business, um, a guy called Johannes Reck, who is the CEO of a very successful company called Get Your Guide here in, 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 in uh, Europe, out of Berlin. Mm -hmm. Johannes started as an advisor. Now he's actually a board member um, and invested also. And, and one of the first things uh, that he told me is don't stick with investors. You have enough money. We, we had just raised 1.5 million. Focus on building a product. Focus on building an MVP and, and, and getting the first customers, which was a great advice. Uh, so I listened to him. And, and then one day he calls me and says, uh, hey, Avi, I told you not to speak with investors, but you have to speak with this guy. And okay. I, okay, I'll speak with him. And the, and the guy was Alex Fickelstein from, from Spark in, uh, in Boston. So Alex and I speak. We connect really well. Uh, it was a video call. And then he says, do you mind if I come over uh, next week? Mm. And, I'm like, and I'm like, what, do you have a trip planned? Or like, no, I just I want to meet you. So, okay, that's interesting. And Alex is a, is a senior partner at, at Spark, right? So he, he's, uh, when... when a GP flies over from Boston, Barcelona, that, you know, this means business, right? So we took it very seriously, obviously. Uh, we spent the day with Alex, uh, my co-founder and, and I. Um, we didn't have a product, at it, or a very basic product, I would say. Um, so it was mainly around getting to know each other as, as, as individuals, right? That, that was kind of the main uh, point. And, and I remember walking, it wasn't a, like today's a rainy, rainy day here in Barcelona, unusually, as I said, but uh, it was... Uh, um, April in Barcelona, which is very nice and sunny. So we were walking down the beach uh, by the ocean and just talking about our vision for the, for the, for the company. What, where, where do we think uh, we should go? How big it can be? And, and during this walk, and, and a few beers were involved as well. Uh, <laughs> and then he said, how about you come to Boston next week and we'll give you a term sheet. And, and I was like, I, I, I couldn't believe it, right? It, it sounded too yeah. real. Spark is a great fund. I mean, I mean, look at the success story they had. It's amazing. I mean, I should probably men not mention too many portfolio companies because I don't want to offend everybody else, but Twitter was, was an early stage investment for them when they, they were, had only a handful of people there. They invested in Cruise that was sold to, one, you know, to, to GM for over $1 billion only eight months after, after they invested. So the A round, so really great portfolio of companies, Trello, you know, Stack Exchange, et cetera. So, yeah. Um, you know, their A player VC and, and kind of getting invited to, to go to Boston and pitch the partnership was, was a really great opportunity. So what do you think was it that, I mean, cause that's a, that is almost sounds too good to be true, right? This guy talks to you on Skype or whatever, and then comes over and you guys are walking down the beach, drinking beers and you know, that leads to a term sheet. What do you think it was it that did he have a thesis about the travel space and he identified yeah. you like, how did this actually happen? So first, yes. I mean, Alex is a very smart travel uh, investor. He you know, invests in, in other verticals as well, but, but he has a few great investments, including at least one unicorn um, that he, he invested in, in the early stage. Yeah, get you right. So um, he's a very uh, experienced and smart travel investor. I think, and, and I spoke with him about it, uh, so I'm, 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 uh, I have some notion of what he had in mind. And basically the way he looked at it was, uh, if you assess all the risks that there is an in investment, uh, you could have a product risk or a market risk or a team risk or, you know, whatnot. Um, we had an interesting idea of a product, an initial product, right? So, yes, of course, there is a risk and we scale the product and we build the next version. That's some kind of risk, but um, we show that we can build at least the first version and get people to use it. Right? At the time, I think we had probably maybe 10 customers, 10 companies using okay. us, something like uh -huh. that. Um, today we're at 1,500, just kind of to give you um, yeah. uh, the order of mag magnitude. We had around 10 companies probably using us, maybe less. Uh, so MVP with an initial product market, not really product market, but initial usage, let's say. Uh, so the product risk was, was minimal, according to him. The market is huge. We're talking about $1.25 yeah. dollars. So there is no question about the market. People will travel for work in the foreseeable future unless Elon Musk comes with like uh, teletransportation or whatever <laughs> technology that kills... Uh, air and, and hotel uh, uh, industries, uh, this, is going, this is here to stay, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so so if, basically, if you look at all the risks, you know, product, markets, um, competition, um, et cetera, et cetera, the only real risk that we had at the time, and we still, you know, to a certain extent, we still have today is execution, right? And that's an interesting risk to have because it mm -hmm. depends on you, right? It's, it's about the quality of the team and, and about the quality of execution and, and strategy. And he just liked that. He liked that, that uh, it's a very clear proposition, solving a real pain point. Travel, nobody likes the way they travel for work. Yeah. So 
solving a real pain in a huge market. Um, you know, I think, you know, a great team uh, that we had already then, uh, and for sure the, the kind of team we have now. So he saw all of that and he was like, that's interesting. Uh, and that's kind of deals that VCs are, are dying to find. Yeah, yeah, and that's good. Yeah, and this, this actually syncs up a little bit with a, a similar interview I had yesterday that, you know, it was a big market, a team that had done things before, and again, kind of execution risk, but, um, but some proof of concept, and that seemed to be a good sweet spot for, for these investors. They were yeah. very different story. They were making an uh, e-commerce platform for plus-size women, but the team had been in fashion together at Guild Group. They had a big market, you know, hundreds of millions of women, and, and that was enough for the investors. Um, yeah. All right, so... So that was a series A. And then um, from there, was it just building products, scaling and, you know, progressively raising more? Or how did you know when to raise the next round? So we, we, we actually, <laughs> it's a good question. The thing is our B and the C looked kind of like the A in the sense that we got an introduction for, uh, to an investor. We were not at, at, at each of the rounds. We were not actually at, the, at that time, we we're not looking to raise. Yeah, this not not very actively like always open to to speaking with people, but never like we didn't we never actively kind of went there and did a roadshow, and and almost the same story actually just meeting great investors, uh, seeing that we have uh, the same ambition and vision about about the product and about about the market, and and then just the deals kind of uh, shaped out of that. Was it was it you know like in the the series A you had Johannes sort of as the catalyst or initiating this to the introduction to Alex Finkelstein at the B and C, was it Alex saying, Hey, let me connect you to, to a couple of guys. I think you guys are ready to talk to them. Or was there some other catalyst? Yeah, it's always introductions. Yeah. I mean, and this is, I think very important also to note. I mean, it, it was always intros from, um, you know, people from the network, right? So if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, the B, so we have two colleagues in the B. I think one of them was actually Johannes again and the other one, was local globe uh, our, our, our angel round investor or seed round uh, investors and then for the seed was also another introduction from uh from an existing investor so always intros were, was kind of the catalyst for for the beginning of the conversation with with the with the lead investor did you ever run a process and really get out and shop the deal around or was it no. a couple introductions term sheet and get back to Business. No, we, no, it's it's actually a, a bit unusual, but we never did like we never pitched it to more than in a, in any given round we never pitched it to more like three funds. Mm. Interesting. This is a different strategy than most of the folks I've talked to. Do you ever feel like you didn't go on enough dates with investors if you <laughs> only talked to three funds per round, or yeah. did you just have a good feeling about the ones you did talk to? Yeah. Yeah, I, th I guess I'm lazy. Uh, I just, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, you always have the, like, the, the, the thought, that, you know, maybe I could have gotten like 10% higher valuation, but uh, I think it's also very important to, to make sure that, that you have a strong fit with, with the investor. So it's not only about valuation because it's a partnership. It's, it's, the, it's, it's the partnership that you, you just cannot unwind, right? I mean, if you yeah. think about partnerships, like business partnerships or, or, or even, you know, marriages, uh, there, are, there are ways out, right? You know, and, and this is the one that you, know, you look at, 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 at uh, an, an SPA and there isn't a way out. You cannot ask the investor to, to step down and, and, and take his money and go away, right? It just doesn't, it doesn't exist. Yeah. So I think uh, this, the cultural fit or, or, or the ambition and how we see the business values, right? Your values as a person and their values as, as people. I think all of it is extremely important and maybe you know, probably more important than valuation within 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 a range of, of reason right but well we're maybe touch on that because i think that's interesting so you know a lot of these calls will talk about almost top building the funnel and how people did that you didn't have to do so much work on building the funnel so how yeah. did you sort of map your business values or what sort of business values were you really trying to optimize for I approach it the same way I approach hiring, right? So, we, so I interview the, the, the investors the way I interview candidates, right? And, and, you, and you ask uh, and exactly the same way. So, so you, ask, you ask them and then you ask them to, to give you an example and, and through stories, through examples, through reference calls about them, right? Which is a, also very important, mm -hmm. uh, both for candidates for, for, you know, to join the company and also for investors. And I think that's something that, that uh, entrepreneurs are always very shy about 
about due diligence on your investors. Uh, and I don't think we should be, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we are, we are uh, let's not forget that in the equation of raising money, we are the ones who are deciding who to buy from. We are buying cash, we're buying cash right? And, and, and we're selling yeah. equity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if, if you have a good company and, and you're able to raise, and you're, you know, you're able to get term sheets, if you can get one term sheet, you get two and three and four. Um, so, so it's up to you to decide who to buy from. And you have to do your diligence. Like you cannot just go into a partnership without knowing who we're talking to. So uh, I, I just interview them like the way I interview uh, candidates. And then I do reference calls and, 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 and we regroup as a team and, and talk about the investor and, and try to assess if they're the right fit for us. Do you have one or two interview questions that you are your favorite or that you find really uncover kind of like, you know, good stuff? <laughs> yeah. So, so I think there is one that is very, it, it's great for, um, for all kinds of interviews. Um, and, and basically, like asking about failure and, and, and how they had handled failure, right? So mm. give me, do you have an example of, of when you failed and, and, and what you learned from it and, and how you approached that? So, but because I, I'm trying to assess companies, you know, especially startups will go through, you know, good times and bad times. And I'm trying to assess how this person will react if we have a quarter of, of missed, you know, growth or, or something, you know, we lose an important uh, team member uh, yeah. with the company. So I'm trying to assess that. Um, and also specifically for investors, so that's kind of a more general question. And then specific for invest investors, um, I have a very strong, we as a team, a very strong, um, um, you know, willingness to create a big independent company here. And just asking straight, I mean, what, what if we get an offer to, to sell the company for $400 million, right? Mm. So what should we do? Um, and, and to make it more precise, I'm talking about like in the next 12 months, right? So imagine if somebody just invested in a much, much, much lower valuation than that, you tell them exit in 12 months, $400 million, what should we do? And, mm -hmm. and I want to see if they are in it for the long term like we are, right? So... Um, the, the obvious answer it should be hell no, right? You know, why would you sell for four hundred if you can create a hundred billion dollar company? So, it's just it's a no brainer. Interesting. So you're using that to gauge whether they be in it for the long term. I can see other founders using a question like that to gauge whether the investor would maybe block an exit. You know, because this is one of these like I want, but I want, conflicts. But, yeah, right? but I wanted to block an exit, right? In in the, uh, this size, right? So. That's actually something very important for us. I want to have around, especially in the board, uh, but also you know, investors that are not on board, I want, them to, I want them to push me to say no, because it will be, I mean, we, we shouldn't kind of uh, uh, fool ourselves, right? I mean, as a founder, especially in early stage, getting an offer to sell your company for 400 million, this is a life-changing amount of money that, that we're talking about. My, right. my, my grandchildren, grandchildren will, not, will never have to work again. And this is stained, so this is a lot of money, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so it's actually the other way around. I want them to block us. I want them to, be, to really put up a fight if, if I, if I, because it would be tough for anybody to say no to this kind of money, right? And, and I want them to be there and say, what are you talking about? You know, didn't you say that you're going to build a multi-billion dollar business? Why are we talking about selling for 400 million, right? So it's actually by design that I want them to be like this. But, you know, just to kind of like play devil's advocate, I mean, there are, that's all great if things continue to go up and to the right and everything goes well, but when things maybe you miss a quarter, a couple quarters, yeah. and then you've got to raise more money, it's usually the founder that suffers the dilution and the protective provisions and the, the VCs are protected because of the term. So, yeah. I mean, does that factor into your kind of, this is a, more of a bigger question, but yeah. Any thoughts on that? We're, we are not in a, in a safe line of business, right? If I wanted safe, I would go to work in a bank. Actually, not, not anymore, right? Even banks are not safe. Right. So, <laughs> so no, I mean, this is a risk, right? And, and we have to, you have to factor it in. And, and we definitely, I, I definitely have it in mind, right? I mean, if, if, we, if we have a down, uh, turn, a down round scenario, I will, yes, I will get diluted a lot, right? This is something that, it's part of the game. As long as you, as you understand the rules of the game, I think it's fine. Uh, the issue is if sometimes you, you don't understand that. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, of course, that's a risk. Uh, completely. Okay, good. 
couple other questions here. I noticed um, I'm looking at like your, if pitch book is correct, you did the series uh, B in May of 2018, then a series C in October of 2018. So it looks like the fundraising's kind of gotten faster between rounds. Um, I mean, are you, I guess, any strategy on that? Are you in a market? Do you have a lot of competitors? Is this like a horse race to gain market share? Or is there any deeper? Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's, it's a great question. Um, yes. The, the, the thing is business travel, the, the whole market is now transforming and moving from, it's like, it's, it's, it, it's, it's a, it's a $1.5 trillion beast that kind of woke up, you know, and, like, mm-hmm. you know, and then, uh, and then the opportunity that almost didn't exist five years ago now is so clear. And the way we see it is we, we are now in 2005, right? This is the year where so many things moved around leisure travel. You know, Booking.com got acquired. And then mm. Expedia, there was a spin-off a few years before that of Expedia. To, you know, so all of these kind of changes in leisure travel that, that ended up with three big uh, players, you know, naming Booking Holding Group, Expedia Group, and now Airbnb is obviously um, growing very, very nicely. Uh, and, and of course, more, more, you know, more smaller players. And this is what is about to happen in business travel. So we're going to see in the next 10, 15 years, um, probably two or three groups uh, that, that will dominate business travel. And will be, you don't have a $100 billion company in business travel. You do have in leisure travel. You know, booking holding is, is now run roughly $100 billion in market mm-hmm. uh, valuation. Expedia is, is, is more than that, but still, you know, it's, it's, it's a very big business. Um, and the same is about to happen in business travel. So this is what everybody's realizing now. And those like us that have a three-year, year, almost four years now, um, you know, head start against everybody else, then, then of course, this is the reason why we're raising, are able to raise more money, uh, plus our growth rate, plus our vision about, about, about things. And the idea is this is a land grab. And, and a lot of companies that are not using any business travel tool today will be using something in the next five years, right? And, and this something should be travel first. So... This is what kind of we're going for, and that's the, hence the importance of, of going fast. And yeah, you need to raise more money to go even faster. Yeah, it looks like uh, most. I mean, Spark is in the U.S., but a lot of the investors are European. I know it's like you had DST, which is Yuri Milner's uh, fund. Right, he's kind of an interesting yeah. personality. What was it like pitching him? How'd you get connected with those guys? So, so to be to be precise, this is Yuri and, and his partner Tom investing uh, uh, personally. This is not DST. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they their checkbook doesn't contain checks small enough to fit our our, our <laughs> mini forty forty four million dollar round. It's it's too small. Um, so we know Tom. Tom is, is Tom Stafford based is based in London. So we know him through again uh, introductions, and he was the one who introduced us to uh, to Yuri. It was probably one of the most interesting and intense uh, uh, pitches I've ever done in, in my life. Uh, Yuri is, is, I don't know if you know, but he's actually a scientist by, by training uh, mm. and, and he's, he's also extremely smart uh, and very interesting guy. And it was a, a longer than, than the average pitch and we almost didn't talk about the business. We talked about, and this is what he was trying to do and, and that's why I liked it so much because he was trying to assess me as a person. And I was trying to assess him as a person. So I think at the end of the conversation, we, we realized that we just like each other as people and we decided to do business together. Interesting. Would you, just for kicks, do you remember one of the topics you guys talked about? Was it a, a probably not? I think, yeah. I, th- I think the main one was ambition, right? And, and, and kind of what's your goal? And, 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 and you know, you and I share the same belief that the kind of work-life balance is kind of a bit of a... Of a uh, a misconcept. Uh, if you really want to be- build a huge business, you really have to dedicate your life to it. And I think this is something that both him and I um, see eye to eye um, on this topic. Good segue. I, I wanted to talk about re- building a startup in Spain uh, and uh, and raising money in Spain. And almost it was seemed contrary to what you just said about uh, you know ambition and everything to, to build it in Spain, right? Because I think yeah. of Spain is your, your holiday destination. What's yeah. it, I guess, why are you in Spain and, and what's it like, uh, what's the startup scene like in Spain? Yeah. So I'm, Sp- I'm in Spain because I moved here for business school and kind of my wife said that we're staying here and I listened to my wife. So that's okay. why we're here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a Smart great, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Learn, learn that very, very young actually. 
Uh, and it's a great destination to, to actually uh, for talent, right? So, so this is one of the hacks that we have in Barcelona that we are able to relocate people from anywhere in the world. We have people here who move from the Valley. We have people who move from any place in Europe. We have people who move from the Middle East, uh, from Asia. And it's just a very easy destination to move to, especially when you're young and, and kind of are interested in doing like a two to four year uh, adventure and maybe stay and maybe not, right? And, and um, so we have a, a lot of smart people that, are, that, are, that moved here for that venture. Um, and the startup scene is actually, um, is becoming really interesting. So it was kind of non-existent. There are a few early success stories, which were basically national uh, champions in Spain. Uh, Prevalia is, is a famous one. Uh, it's an e-commerce, a fashion e-commerce website. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, acquired by Von Prive. Uh, uh, um, Trovit, uh, Budget Places. You had a few online successes. All of them, Social Point is another one. It's a gaming company. Uh, all of them in the range. So, so, so relative to, to Europe, it's, it's, it's a nice success. We're talking, we're talking about range of you know, 80 to $400 million exits. Um, so these are nice ranges for Europe. They're not as, as impressive for, for the Valley. You know? um, and that was kind of the, the previous generation. And now you have a new generation of startups that is more global and less thinking about Spain as the core market. Mm -hmm. And just to name a few, I mean, Buddy is, 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 a, is a great startup here. Uh, they're, they're helping, it's an app to help people find uh, roommates, okay. uh, created by extremely smart young entrepreneur. Um, uh, Glovo is another one. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an everything delivery app, um, doing amazingly well. They just closed, I think, another round of, of more than $100 million. Raised. Um, so, uh, and expanding extremely fast to um, uh, South America, as well as I think Africa, they mentioned last time uh, in a press release. So yeah, a few of these. Uh, it's not as vibrant as, as the Valley, for sure. It's not as vibrant as Tel Aviv or even Berlin yet. Uh, but it's, it's definitely up and coming. It's definitely beginning now for, is, for a, new, is, a, new, a new generation. Is, it, is the startup scene concentrated in Barcelona or Madrid, or, or is it spread around? So you have, you have Madrid and Barcelona, two hubs. Barcelona has more um, you know, in direct investments, so more VC money flowing into it, from, especially for foreign investors or non-Spanish investors. And I think by just number of, like absolute number of startups, Barcelona has more than Madrid, but definitely Madrid has a few interesting startups as well. So it's, these are the two hubs that exist in Spain. There is one company in Valencia that I know of, right? So Flywire is in, is, is in half Valencia, half in Boston. And then the rest of the cities are more, yeah, holiday destination rather than kind of startup uh, destinations. You mentioned, I think this was kind of fun. The hack is to, you know, get people to move to, 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 to Barcelona. Um, can you recruit there and what's the talent pool like and what's the work ethic like of, of local talent? Yeah. So local talent exists, um, hiring great people, especially, um, you know, engineers, designers, uh, but also, you know, all, all roles basically is never easy. I don't think it's, it's easy in any place in the world to hire great people. Uh, and, and for the great talent, everybody's fighting for, uh, and, and we, yeah, as I said, we do have, you know, some competition in terms of other startups and, and also bigger companies. Um, local talent is great. You have a young generation of engineers and, and designers and product owners that have traveled, that have worked abroad, uh, and came back with these notions of, of, you know, thinking about a startup in the right way, I would say, uh, not as a lifestyle business, but really as kind of scaling a, a business to very big size. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, we're doing the education ourselves for sure. And, um, and actually, we don't have an issue around work ethic. It's, 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 I think it's more of maybe outside of the big cities. I'm not Spanish, so I don't know exactly if it's a, like a, a, it's a true stereotype or, or just a stereotype. But I don't see it in Barcelona that much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. Um, okay, great. Any, any tips for any Spanish startups that are, uh, you know, up and coming, maybe, you know, at the early stages, raising seed, Series A, just to navigate the, the scene? Is there any... Start, start yeah. yeah. I would say start, start uh, global day one. Think big. Don't try to be number one in Spain. Try to be number one, at least in Europe, if not globally. Um, yeah. As, as an, and don't be afraid to be ambitious. I think there's a lot of kind of shyness. You know, I think something that, that everybody can learn from, from Americans, especially from, from, from the Valley, is uh, being extremely bold with, with, you know, statements, even in the early days, you know. People start, you know, there are three people in a garage and they talk about being the number one in something, you know, globally, mm -hmm. 
right? And, and I think this kind of ambition is, is, is crucial to, to create your startup. You cannot be anything less than that in, in, your, in your ambition. Yeah, good. Um, and then I guess just in general, navigating the European uh, venture scene, it sounds like almost all of this, you know, started from introductions, but any yeah. thoughts on tips of, of just raising money in Europe? You know, any yeah. advice you would give? Yeah, so, so at the moment there is a lot of money uh, and a lot of opportunities and great investors have raised, you know, big funds and are looking to invest. So there isn't any, any kind of liquidity issue right now in the market, uh, especially early stage. Uh, not that I see, uh, and especially not in Europe. Um, so the, the key is, yeah, it, I, I, it sounds tough. And, and I think a lot of kind of first time entrepreneurs, uh, especially if they never raised for their startup, are kind of a bit confused about how do you get around to getting introduced introdu 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 to, to investors, but it's not that difficult. I mean, at the end of the day, as I said, you, are, you, are, um, you have a product that the investors are, are really, really inter interested to know about. Their job is to find great companies and deploy lot, uh, as much capital as they can into this company. Um, so don't be shy about asking for introductions and use your network. And if you don't have a network, build your network. And if you don't know how to do it, well, that's your first task in, as a founder and you have many other challenges uh, in the future. So it's not, nobody says it's easy. By the way, the, uh, my first recommendation is do not start a company. Come and join my company because uh, <laughs> sure. we need great people. And if you're really, really, really crazy and you, you still want to do it and, don't, and you're not listening to my advice, then uh, you should really not give up. And, and it's, it's difficult to create your network. It's difficult to get introductions, but that's, I think, the best way to, to approach it, especially in the early stage. I think that's good advice. And this is also a, a pattern I've heard on a lot of these interviews. Uh, I'll ask the, interv the, the founder where they kind of built that network. And a lot of them intentionally went to work at a startup, you know, that was on a growth trajectory, partly just to build the network before starting yeah. their own. So I think that's a, a longer term hack um, but yeah, it's a good hack, actually. <laughs> and, 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 and here's, here's a, a, support, a supporting evidence for, for what you just said. Uh, as I said, I sold my first startup to, to the Priceline Group, the Book and Holding Group, they call it now. Uh, the CEO, currently the CEO of the group is, 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 is an amazing person called Glenn Fogel. Uh, he's a legend, actually, in, in online travel. He's the one who acquired, he bought Booking.com for not a lot of money. I think it was a hundred something million dollars. And this asset is worth north of 80 billion now um, as a part wow. of the group, right? So he's, I would say, arguably the best M&A person in, in, for sure in travel, but maybe in history. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not aware of all M&As that happened. Um, I know Glenn because he came to meet us in my previous company where I was an employee, right? So I joined the startup as an employee. I met Glenn. We kept in touch. And then I called him when I was looking for investors in my, in my startup. So just to support what I just said, I mean, if you don't have a network, a great way to build your network is join a company that has investors and you can meet the investor. And a company like ours, we are very happy with people, you know, for, for, for employees to join the board meeting, present something. Uh, we do dinners where, where uh, you know, people from the team are, are invited to meet the investors and the board members. It's a great way to, meet, to build your network for sure. Yeah, no, that's great. Very good. All right. Well, I will let you get back to building Travel Perk. Um, <laughs> Anything you want to uh, plug, promote, open job recs, discounts, deals, anything happening that you want to call attention to? So uh, I think it's a great service to your, to your listeners. If, if they travel for work, they need to know about Travel Perk because we are a way better solution than whatever they have. So if you're listening to this and you're traveling for work, get in touch, tra travelperk.com or send me an email, avi, A-V-I, at travelperk.com. I'll be happy to talk to you. Avi at travelperk.com and is this something relevant i mean could a startup with four people use it or is it yeah. more enterprise yeah well no, we actually are, are focused on on small and medium-sized businesses so startups are a great customer for us and we are a great solution for them yeah that's cool all right this is great fun fun stuff congratulations on on raising multiple rounds and the growth uh 1500 companies pretty cool um so good stuff we'll look for you after your next round how's that sound Sounds good. Hopefully it will be more than six months from now because we need to focus on building. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.